Calvary Chapel, Mars Hills. I guess it's the official start of the Christmas season, so I'm um, going to sing some Christmas songs this morning. Oh 
just raise those empty hands to the Lord to be filled. Amen. Join me in prayer. Lord, we are so thankful that we can be here. Lord, in the presence of your majesty, Lord. Lord, it's something that is for myself that I've been thinking a lot about, that we are all so uniquely different, Lord, but we are here because of you, and you have changed us so much by your love. And Lord, we desire to be continually changed by you, Lord, and we continue to we desire to continually, Lord, praise you in your majesty. Lord, be with us now as we turn our attention to your word and to the study of it, Jesus. Be with us now, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Well, good morning, and welcome to Calvary Chapel, Morris Hills. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Pastor John. Thank you for being with us here today. Our mission here is helping people grow into committed followers of Jesus Christ. If you are new with us, or if you haven't been here in a while, you'll find in the seat pocket in front of you a connection card, and if you wouldn't mind filling out as much information as you're comfortable with on the front and on the back, you could drop it in the offering box at the back of the room on your way out, or if it's your first time filling one out, you can take it to our connection table, which is out the back doors and to the right, and they will have a gift for you there today if it's your first time. At this time, we would like to please have you silence your cell phones. Put them on airplane mode, vibrate, turn them off. If you would like someone to pray with you or pray for you after the service, there will be people up here on either side of the stage. They'll have a name badge on that says prayer so you can easily identify them, and they would love to pray with you today. Looking into our programs, the first insert is for our annual Christmas luncheon, which is today after second service. So we're in first service, so please feel free to either stick around or even come back. It'll be in a wonderful time of, of a meal together and a fellowship. So that's today after the second service. The second insert is about our snow removal team. This team touches up the salting and the, and the removing of icy spots in the parking lot after the plows have come through and cleared the lot. They come through and they make it safe for us to come in and out of the building. And so very important ministry. Care very much about everyone's safety. So that's about our, our snow removal team. The next insert is for our Angel Tree Christmas Outreach. Again, we've been announcing this over the last few weeks. This is our second year doing this. Angel Tree works with Prison Fellowship, and they help kids who have parents who are incarcerated during the holiday times. What we can do is we can sponsor or we can uh, choose to donate to a family, and Angel Tree will then go and buy a present on behalf of the parents and give it to the child. And so it's a a wonderful way to minister to both the parents and the kids. Uh, the QR code is on the, is on the uh, insert. So it'll be on the screens in between services. You can use your smartphone, hold up your camera to that, and it'll link you to a website. I believe as of today, we're 50% of the way through what, we, uh, what I registered us for, so we're doing an awesome job. Thank you guys so much for that. Lives will be definitely impacted through this ministry. So thank you for those that have already been a part of it, and thank you to you guys for being so faithful and Loving others for Christ. The last insert is the uh, they are the community group questions for the week. We do have extra copies at the connection table and on the greeter table as you exit. There are also Spanish questions at the connection table. 
Tonight, after everything else today, we will be having our youth ministry, the refinery. That's for current 6th through 12th graders. Uh, so we'll be meeting around the back of the building. Uh, it'll be from 5.30 to 7.30. And we'll have you know, some food. We'll have some games and some, some time in the Word. So that'll be tonight. Uh, two weeks from today, on December 17th, we'll be having our Calvary Kids Christmas program. So if you are a parent and you did not get the songs emailed to you on Friday... Please go to the connection table after service or email the church early in the week and we'll get those to you quickly. But that'll be two weeks from today on December 17th. At this time, I would like to have you please open your Bibles or turn on your device to Ruth chapter 3. Ruth chapter 3, if you're using the Bibles here in the seat, it's page 242. Page 242. If you would like a free Bible, you, you can find them out the back doors and to the right on the round counter. We have uh, translations in English and in Spanish. We just ask that you put your name and your phone number in it in case you accidentally leave it behind. We can get it to you quickly. There are also other free resources on that shelf as well. If you are watching online and you would like a, a free Bible, please contact us here at the church, and we will be glad to send one to you this week. So, well, let's all stand for the reading of God's Word. Today's scripture reading is from the book of Ruth, chapter 3, verses 6 through 13. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law instructed her. And after Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was cheerful, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. And she came softly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. Now it happened at midnight that the man was startled and turned himself. And there, a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, who are you? So she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. Then he said, blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, in that you did not go after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear, I will do for you all that you request, for all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. Now it is true that I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. Stay this night, and in the morning it shall be that if he will perform the duty of a close relative for you, good, let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you. As the Lord lives, lie down until morning. This is God's word. Please be seated. Well, good morning. Good morning. Merry, Christmas. Merry Christmas. See, when this food second service, there's a lot more room in this service, right? <laughs> so uh, you're welcome to come back, as Pastor John said. For those of us who've been Christians a long time, uh, that last song we sang made me really glad that I was not coming up here right after the song because the tears were streaming down my face. Uh, we used to sing kind of like old music, you know, organ, piano music. Not that I'm against that stuff. Uh, but, uh, and then all of a sudden, guys would start, started to write songs like that, Majesty. And we were like, wow, I can't believe people could write you know, songs like this. And so we were just so enamored with that, uh, with that kind of music. We take it for granted now, but it was a very, very different time when modern praise and worship started to go from uh, organ music and piano music, again, nothing wrong with that, to kind of corny music, <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to really good stuff. So it was, uh, it's really, it was a, an amazing thing. So, okay, we ready? Oh, boy. <laughs> On this beautiful, beautiful, rainy day. Does the weather get any worse than it is today? Absolutely horrible. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you right now. And uh, oh, such fond memories. And I'm so thankful that songs like that still bring a tear to my eye. And Lord, may we never, any of us ever, get over the wondrous things that you have done for us and you continue to do for us as you invite us to be your people. Pray for today, that today would be a day where 
uh, your people would come together and enjoy one another's company. I know there's some people that are here that are going to get stuff ready for the next service. Others have other things to do, Lord, but we are thankful for this season, Lord. Help us not to forget that it is the gift of your son that we remember. And so be with us now as we study your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I received quite a number of emails regarding our uh, baptism service the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving. If I could summarize those emails into one sentence, it would be this, or a few words, what a night, what a night. And to me, that summarizes Ruth chapter 3, so much I've stolen the title of the message today from some of those emails, and the title of our message today is, What a Night. Uh, just for review, if you haven't been with us, I know in the next service some people may be inviting some friends to uh, luncheon, and so I wanted to just give a review. So if there, someone comes as a guest there, if you're here, I've been here in a while, you understand what's going on. In chapter one, we're in chapter three, but in chapter one, Naomi, uh, her husband and her two sons, because there was a famine, left the protection of the promised land for place called Moab, the land of God's enemies. There in Moab, her husband Elimelech dies. There in Moab, her two sons married Moabite women, which they weren't supposed to do. And then her two sons died. Uh, after that, Naomi heard that God had visited his people, that the, the famine was over. And during the time of the judges, there was, you know, God would do let stuff happen to remind, hey, I'm here, come back. And they'd come back and then God would bless them again. So the Lord visited his people and there was food in the promised land. So she returned to where she was from, Bethlehem, which actually ironically means the house of bread. Now, Naomi tried to get her two daughters-in-laws to stay in Moab, and one did, but Ruth uh, became a follower of Yahweh and went back to the promised land with Naomi. Uh, Naomi's name means pleasant, but when she got to back to Bethlehem, she was so sad. She told everyone, call me Mara. That name means bitter. Because why? Because she was dying of a broken heart having lost her husband and her two sons. Uh, in Ruth chapter 2, Ruth uh, goes out to work for food and meets a rich and godly man named Boaz, who, as fate would have it, we were told earlier at the beginning of chapter 2, but she would learn later on, was related to her deceased father-in-law, uh, Elimelech. And then Naomi realizes that God, although she's sad, God is taking care of her through a family member, a provision, which the Old Testament law outlined, the law of Moses, would call a goel or a kinsman redeemer. Another part of the law of Moses was that if someone was a brother-in-law or a brother would marry the widow in a family, we call it leveret marriage, but Boaz was not required to do this. But Naomi tells Ruth, well, why don't you go check it out? So after the heart, when it comes time for a harvest, uh, she says, wash up, put on some perfume, and uh, go to the harvest party and seek marriage or something else, we don't really know, with, with Boaz. Now, Bible scholars debate the wisdom of this. It is the period of the judges. There's a lot of wickedness in the land. Uh, not the idea of marriage, but the idea is it safe for her to go to this thing because uh, we know that at these harvest parties. There was a lot of immorality. There was prostitutes there. Uh, also, her reputation might be at stake. The Bible says, do not give into the appearance of evil. Uh, once again, sisters, if you were not here last week, Ruth chapter 3 has absolutely no dating advice for you at all. So if you're confused, please come see me, and uh, I'll be happy to talk with the man for you. It's uh, one of the great parts about being a pastor or being a big brother. Uh, anyway, uh, Naomi is desperate. She, she knows she's getting older and she wants Ruth to be provided for. And the Lord, she knows now the Lord is beginning to work because of meeting Boaz just by happenstance through his divine providence. So I want to go back to the very beginning of the chapter to give us the words that, so we, as we go into this chapter, we, we get, it really sets the scene for us. It says this, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, and we covered these five verses last week, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I need not seek security, translation, husband, uh, for you that it may be well with you? Now Boaz, whose young women you were with, is he not 
our relative. In fact, he is, a win- he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. And remember, we said it's a dangerous place. Lots of sinful behavior going on. Therefore, wash yourself and anoint yourself, put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. Now, that best garment is not some, you know, not, she's not like, well, make sure you look really, you know, inviting or something like that. It's cold. So she, you know, make sure you, you're warm. Verse four, then it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies and you shall go in, uncover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what you should do, Okay. Do you hear that, girls? There's no dating advice in this chapter. (laughs) All the mothers are writing their thank you notes to me right now. And she said to her, verse 5, all that you say to me, I will do. So Naomi says, okay, everything you said, I'm going to go do it. Now we get into where we are this week, verse 6. So she went down to the threshing floor. That's where they separated the wheat from the chaff, and they, so they get the, get the good stuff out, and did according to all that her mother-in-law instructed her or all that her mother commanded her or told her to do, verse 7. Uh, and after Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was cheerful. We don't really know what that means. Does it mean he was in good spirits? Does that mean he was drunk? That means he was happy? We don't know. He went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain or the pile of barley, and she came softly or quietly, the idea is, uncovered his feet and lay down. Now, just picture this for Ruth. This is a scary situation. So she comes into the midst of all of these guys. They're partying it up. They're getting drunk. Uh, We know that they're... Hosea told us that there was prostitutes on the scene there. And so she's slowly sneaking around in the dark, making sure she's not seen, but she has to see where Boaz is going to go. Now, this may seem odd to you, but uh, true faith makes us vulnerable. It really does. And, And she's in a vulnerable position now. And how does true faith make us vulnerable? Because we trust God with every single area of our life. That's what true faith really is. is Sometimes we think, oh, I I have a great idea to do this. And God's like, no, don't do that. Or you're like, that would violate the Bible or or something like that. And and so faith is a vulnerable thing. And we think of Ruth here, but also for Boaz as well. He's a man who's clearly in sync with God. and, And God has blessed his work. God has blessed his business. And what will he do in this situation? Now, we've said before that, that Boaz is a picture of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's over 1,000 years, probably about 1,200 years before Jesus lived. He's a man who trusts God with his life. And Ruth's faith and Naomi's faith at this time is in Boaz's character. And loved ones, that's the same thing for us. Our faith is in the character of God. And as we will see, Boaz is a gentleman, He's not some time of the judge's creeper. Uh, he's going to try and t- take advantage of Ruth. And to be honest, it's quite possible if anybody up there saw her and they, they were from out of town, they may have assumed that she was just a Moabite prostitute. So who knows any side comments that might have been coming her way. Yet the opposite is true. Uh, she lays at his feet the place of humility. And it's a reminder of how we are to approach the Lord. I know a lot of people, you know, there's a time to, to really say to the Lord, hey, we, you know, you told us this and we believe this and we, we claim this, Lord, but, but that's how we really should approach the Lord. And, and it's not sexual here at all. There's nothing to give us in this chapter anything regarding that. However, the scene is quite intimate. What is it? It's a believing pagan woman and her trusted redeemer. And and when we meet with God, perhaps when we pray, we should think about that a little bit more carefully, that we are sinful people meeting with the holy God and the pure God of the universe. And this this is a picture of what we call saving faith. It's deeply, deeply personal. Ruth has left Moab behind to meet the Lord and to join the people of God. And now she has made herself vulnerable, trusting that the Lord is going to do the right thing. And you know, a lot of people don't want to do that, do they? They, they, want to, they want to kind of be the masters of their own destiny. Not many people even also understand that we enter faith alone. You can't, she can't ride Naomi's wave into heaven. 
You can't ride grandma and grandpa's wave into heaven if you're here and you're here with your parents. You, you can't ride their wave into heaven. You've got to come in on your own. But Jesus said this, Matthew 7, 13, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Why is it? Why is it that many go in by it? Well, this, it's very simple. They are the people who don't receive the forgiveness of sins and eternal life by putting their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So we come to verse 8, uh, verse 8 and 9, and uh, let's just take a second. Let's step away from Ruth for a second and put yourself in Boaz's sandals, all right? Now it happened at midnight that the man, Boaz, was startled. Yeah, that's kind of weird, right? You go to sleep and all of a sudden somebody's at your feet. That's, I can understand that. He wakes up. He, he, he turned himself, or he turned over, and behold, there a woman, Ruth, was lying at his feet. That, how many of you would think that would be surprising? <laughs> all of a sudden you wake up, right? Right? You're like, who, who, what's going on here? It's dark. And he said, what's up, girl? No, he didn't say that, <laughs> he didn't say that at all. <laughs> he says, who are you? So she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing. Now, we'll have to come back to that in a moment. Bank that, bank that remark there for a minute. Or some versions say, under the corner of your garment. Other versions say, spread your wings, for you are a close relative. Remember, we went over it a couple weeks ago. That was, you're a, you're a redeemer. You're a, you're, you're a goel, meaning that you are someone who... Uh, protects me. So really, when, when this terminology of take me under your wing, which means take me under your protection, which would, or, or, or cover me with your blanket, it, the whole idea is basically this is our equivalent of an engagement ring. Right? So she's, she's, he knows, we're going to see, he knows what she's saying. Now, many people like to say, oh, this is such a great love scene. This is not a great love scene. Ruth basically says, you're a relative. I'm asking you if you'd be willing to marry me and give me an heir. Remember, an heir, you know, was very important then to have someone to inherit your, your fortune or whatever you had. That, this whole scene may seem very odd to us, but actually this may be the greatest expression of faith in the entirety of the book of Ruth. I mean, she is going out on a limb. She's saying, okay, you are related to me. God has made a provision for that in his, in his word. I know you're not obligated to do this, but I'm going to ask you to take a step of faith. So Ruth is asking both God and Boaz to fulfill covenant promises. He's already done it with food for her, but now by marriage and again providing an heir. What is, what is Ruth doing? She's She's trusting in the covenant promises of God. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, if you go out and you look at the polls, if you say to people, do you believe in God? Oh, yes, I believe in God. I believe in God. You know, most people, a lot of people go to church. They'll say, I, I believe in God. I believe in God. But for most people, do they really? For most people, their belief in God is based upon what? Their own opinions. What do you think, what do you think about God? Tell me what you think about God. You're not going to get many people who would really answer in a way where God would say, that's a good answer. I always ask people, you know, when I go out on the streets, we've been doing outreaches for years, you know, uh, 18 years, you know, anywhere from three to six a, a year, except off for COVID. Um, but uh, that's a lot of outreaches. And, and I'll say to somebody, can you tell me something about Jesus? And they'll say, he died on the cross for our sins. Most people will answer that. And I'll say, that's great. What does that mean? Do you know one, only one person has answered me correctly in all of these years? 17-year-old kid. I said, go tell your pastor he's doing a good job. Then I met some other people from his church, and I wasn't quite so sure. <laughs> I figured, where did he learn that from? But anyway, so, but, but what is, what is, it's not, faith is not based on your opinion. There are people who have opinions of you that might be wrong. Did you ever think about that? Right? And you're like, ah, oh, I didn't say that, or not. that's not true. True faith is trusting in what God has said about himself. True faith is trusting in what God has promised. 
Last week, again, we looked at what God promised to carry on family names and inheritances, the Old Testament promises of the Redeemer or the Goel, the provider, and lover at marriage, which would be what the brother-in-laws would, the brothers would marry uh, their brother's wife if they were deceased um, and carry on. The first son would be his, would carry his name. Well, what about now? We don't have that stuff now. We live in a time where faith and trust in Jesus Christ is the covenant promise of God. It's the promise that God has made in the person of Jesus Christ. So if, if you're not a follower of Jesus and you're here or you're, you're watching online or you're listening on the radio, uh, today you can actually say this to God. You can say, you promised the forgiveness of sins and eternal life in heaven to anyone who what Jesus said, repent and believe, would we, we say you would repent, turn to God, believe, put their trust in Jesus. God, I'm doing that today and I want that. You can actually say that to God. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 in the New Testament, the apostle Paul, after Jesus had ascended to heaven, said this, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, now anybody can do that, right? And believe in your heart. Yeah, that's the catch. We don't know who believes and who doesn't. That God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Same chapter, chapter Romans 10, verse 13. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So you can actually say to God, you promised if I call on your name. You promised if I'm willing to turn from my sin and turn to you that I would be saved. You promised that if I put my trust in Jesus, that I can go to heaven. You promised all of these things. That's what belief and true faith in God is. Not, well, I think, you know, because I gave, you know, you know five bucks at the office that I should go to heaven. Really? And God had to send his son to die on a cross for the five bucks you gave at the office. Wow, that's impressive. I'm sure heaven's like, oh, here he comes, Mr. Five Bucks. <laughs> Let's go back to Boaz and Ruth. Here we see that Boaz is a God-centered man. All of a sudden, he wakes up. He knows what goes on at the threshing floor in the middle of the night. He knows what some of the other guys are doing right now. So he has to, we've got to ask ourselves, for Boaz, is this temptation or is this opportunity? Now, now some of us, we think, well, no, of course, he's Boaz. He's you know, the you know, type of Jesus. Let's, come on now. No, just think about it, though. What is it for him? What do I do? So he says, who are you? She says, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Now, all throughout this book, do you know what they've been calling Ruth? The Moabite. Ruth the Moabite. Ruth from that wicked, wicked land of Moab. Now she says, I'm your maidservant. Why? Because she has a new identity. She's no longer Ruth the Moabite. She's now Ruth, a child of God. That's one of the beautiful things about becoming a child of God is you get a new identity. She says, take me under your wing, translation, protect me, marry me. Now in chapter two, you say, well, how do you know this stuff? Well, in chapter two, Boaz had said that he knew Ruth had come out of Moab and had come under the Lord's wing for refuge. What, what, what is that? He saw faith in her. He realized that I've met girls from Moab before. You're not like them. You're completely different. Now, Ruth says to Boaz, she flips it. Boaz saw it in chapter two. Now here in chapter three, she flips it and says, would you like to be part, become part of God's refuge and rest and protection in my life? I know God's at work in my life. Do you want to become part of that? Is, is that part of God's plan for you, Boaz? Now, it's interesting. Remember, we read it at the beginning. Ruth was supposed to do what he says. Doesn't he, maybe he did speak, but bet this guy barely gets a word in edgewise. Who are you? B boom, she's off to the races. <laughs> she's, whether she's nervous or she knows what she wants to say, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. She just starts talking. She says, you are a close relative. That is a quote from what uh, 
Naomi said about him. Now, remember that word A, because we're going to need that later. You are a redeemer. You are a relative. You are a provider. You are a goel. But like we saw last week, he, was, he wasn't a brother, so he's under no obligation to marry her. But Ruth is a, is a woman of faith now. She's a very, very different person. So what does she do? If you know any Jewish words, it appears that she's got a lot of chutzpah right now. That's spelled with a C-H, by the way. Chutzpah. And uh, I remember I was a salesman for a, in a, for a company that was Jewish, and, and the, the guy I was taking out was mentoring me, and the first couple clients we talked to, he's got a, he says to me, you've got to have a little more chutzpah, kid. And I said, okay, I will. And he goes, do you know what chutzpah is? I I said, I have no idea. (laughs) So he explained it to me. So what is is her chutzpah? She, 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 in faith, asked the boss to marry her. Will you marry me? A rich Israelite man of faith is asked by a poor Moabite woman, would you be willing to marry me? Little do they know, note to file, chapter 4. We're gonna, I'm not going to find that out till after the new year. Little do they know, if they do marry, by God's providence, remember she wants an heir, in her family line will include King David and ultimately the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a long way from being a Moabite woman, isn't it? That's a very long way. Loved ones, that's a big part of the reason why we exist as a church. To invite others. We we learn about God, and that's important. But also to invite others to be part of the family of God. God calls the church the bride of Christ. In other words, to be part of the family line of the Lord Jesus Christ a heaven-bound child of the king of heaven. We tell people the words of Jesus, what it's like to come under the Lord's wing for refuge. Very famous words. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3 at the Last Supper. Let not your heart be troubled. Let me ask you a question. Let me stop right there. How many people do you know right now are living with troubled hearts? Well, maybe a little bit easier. How many people do you know who aren't living with troubled hearts? Everything is so troubled. Our, our economic situation, it's uh, the world situation. Watching ridiculous politicians supposedly debating the issues while they're really acting like five-year-olds in a playground, <laughs> yelling at each other. I mean, my goodness, I was telling some people the other day, if I was a moderator to one of those debates, I would just say right from the beginning, you interrupt, I shut your mic off. That's it. And good luck getting it turned back on. I'll give you one warning, but the second one, that's it. How rude. How rude. It's the only thing I can tell you about who's ever going to be the next president of the United States, they will be rude. (laughs) It's the only thing. It's just absolutely terrible. So our our hearts are troubled, and maybe that's part of the message we want to tell people, that there is someone that we can count on, a rock. Now, it helps if you are hanging on to that rock yourself. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Remember, this is the night before the crucifixion. He's telling the guys who's going away, you believe in God, believe also in me. Who did he just equate himself to? God. In my Father's house are many mansions, And then I just love this next expression. If it were not so, I would have told you. Tells us a lot about God's word, doesn't it? God's like, hey, listen. If it wasn't so, I would have told you. I I laid it out. I told you the way it is. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. What does he say? I'm going to come back for you. 
and I'm going to bring you to my father's house. And there, your heart will never be troubled again. You see, Boaz's response to Ruth, as we will see, he, he knows exactly what Ruth was talking about. Verse 10. Then he said, blessed are you of the Lord. Uh, some versions say, may the Lord bless you. Let's stop right there. He doesn't be like, I'm Boaz, do you know who I am? I'm one of the biggest landowners in Bethlehem. Your poor Moabite women have been here a few months. What do you think this is? Right? I'm going to marry a woman of influence and power and prestige. Who are you? No, he doesn't say that at all. He, he says, blessed are you of the Lord, or may the Lord bless you, my daughter, for you have shown, shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, or more kindness now than before in what you did, not go after young men. Some of your versions say not pursued younger men, whether poor or rich. Let's stop right there for a second. What is he saying? You actually came to me, because you know that I am a relative. And, and you know the law of Moses. You know that I am a provider for you. Verse 11. And now, my daughter, do not fear. Who used to say that over and over and over again? Jesus. Jesus. I will do for you all that you request. For the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. She's only been there a couple months. But they've seen it already. She, or some versions say a woman of excellence or a woman of noble character. You see, Boaz sees something, and, and I think that this is something we need to be on the lookout for people that we know to encourage them is that God has done an incredible work in Ruth's life. Absolutely incredible. I mean, for what the reputation was of the Moabites, to have this woman come in and see her loyalty to Naomi, her loyalty to the Lord, her loyalty to the word of God, her trust in the promises of God, He's done an incredibly great work in her life. She is truly a new creation. She is not the same person she once was. And I know for some of you that are newer to the faith, you're all of a sudden, you're like, I don't even know who I am. It, I mean, it, it took me two years to figure out who I was. And now I'm a chronic reader. So I got all these books. I read all these books to try and figure out that I just had a nervous breakdown or something like that. And then the more I read, the more I believed. So she's godly. She's a woman of grace. So, so the assumption here that maybe the younger guys would be interested in is that maybe Ruth is, is pretty or something like that. But she possesses the, the most wonderful thing, ladies, that a woman can possess. Her beauty is in her godliness. Those of you men who are single and maybe in the market for a wife, remember these things, okay? Because, or if your wife is that, remember that. Because that is, you know, here's what happens. Most people say, I don't look as good as I did when I was young. But if you see godliness in your spouse, they will look better than when they look, than they were young. You say, how in the world do you know that, Pastor Jim? Because I married it 34 years ago yesterday. And I looked at that girl last night. Notice I said, that girl? She's still younger than me. <laughs> and I thought, God, you have just really blessed me. Really blessed me. Proverbs 31.10 says, who can find a virtuous wife? Who can find a virtuous, godly woman? For her worth is far above rubies. That, that more than, she's worth more than diamonds. 
Sadly, that is not a value in our culture today. And you young people, I'll be long gone if Jesus doesn't return. Our culture will pay a price for that. And we already are paying a price for that. Because it's not a value that we hold dear to our hearts. Now, just one little side note. Uh, before you old guys start asking all the younger women out, figuring you're Boaz. <laughs> I always think of Pam and I as Ruth and Boaz. I'm like, you're like Ruth, and then I think, well, I'm not like Boaz, so there goes that illustration. <laughs> but uh, that's not what's going on here. Ruth is seeking the covenant promises of God to provide. That's what's going on here. Right about now, all the staff guys are just jotting in their phones. Reminder to thank Pastor Jim for telling the old guys not to ask out all the younger women and saving us a lot of time. <laughs> that doesn't mean that if you, you're a young woman and you like some older guy, I'm going to say, no way. I don't want to be misquoted on that. See, the key word here. In our culture, we'd be like, oh, this older guy with this younger woman, that's not the key word here. The key word here is the word kindness. But not, I know some of the young guys are after you and you're being kind to me by asking me to marry you. Nope. Boaz told her about her kindness in chapter two. That's why, you know, a lot of people pick verses out of the Bible. You gotta re That's why we go through line by line so we get the whole flow of the book. So what did, he th what did he say about her kindness in chapter two? That it was kindness towards her once bitter mother-in-law, Naomi. Once again, this is covenant kindness in that Ruth is willing to raise up an heir for Naomi and Elimelech. You're not being selfish. You're not taking the guy that works best for you. You have a, you have a covenant loyalty to God and to, his, and to your family. So what is Ruth doing? She's under no obligation to do this. She is going over and above the law. Like Boaz, when he says, I'll do everything you do, I'll say, they're, they're, they're both going to the spirit of the law. More than the mere requirements, the spirit of the law wanting to give Naomi an heir. This goes back to the oath she made in chapter one. And Boaz says to her, the whole town's seen it in you. Everybody sees it. There's nobody wondering what, like, what's the deal with that Ruth. They're like, man, can you imagine how she flipped that town? That, 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 that can actually happen to a church where one or two people can come in, start following Jesus, who you didn't expect to at all. And, and, and you're like, man. So here you have this woman from Moab, God's enemies. We hate the Moabites. She comes in and her godliness puts everybody else to shame. She is so on fire for God, they don't even know what to do with her. Ruth is truly a child of the God of Israel, a true convert. Now, allow me to be corny for one second, just one second. Can I be corny for one second? She's been changed by love. <laughs> you rotten people. I warned you, you could have went like this. She's been changed by God's love from the inside out. Boaz has seen it in her heart and he is willing to endure any ridicule from the people in town for marrying that young Moabite woman just like Jesus who was willing to endure the ridicule on the cross to bring all of us into the family of God. This reminds us that, that faith is not just in our, in our heads and not just in our hearts it's something we do. It's the way we live. Boaz is like, I, I realize that God is at work here. Personally, I believe that faith is a gift from God, but a gift we must use for it to be effective. Now, I'm not like, oh, no, he's turned into one of those prosperity preachers. Here we go. 
I'm not saying name it and claim it, or as some of you might call it, blab it and grab it. But holding on tightly to Jesus and living for him. To to Boaz, her character is obvious. Remember, they're still there in the dark. Her character is obvious. This woman is not looking for a one-night stand and then going to try and guilt him into it. She is seriously living for God. Boaz knows a lot of younger men will be interested in her. By the way, Boaz was out working all day all the time. So it's not like he's just, you know, some guy who just can't even get around or anything like that. But in Ruth's case, it was she was working hard, serving people, providing for her mother-in-law because they were poor. She wasn't spending her time walking around promoting herself or hanging out with the right people. What was she doing? The New Testament calls this, Galatians 5, 6. It was faith working through love. That's what it was. True faith in Jesus is a life to be lived. It's who we are. It's who we are. Back in verse 4, Naomi said to her, he will tell you what you should do. But boy, she flipped it, didn't she? Now she's telling him what to do. Now maybe she's not telling, maybe she's asking. In the spirit of the law, she's saying, would you consider me for Leverite marriage? Notice as she lives in faith, she hears those famous words that are all throughout the Bible. Do not fear. Do not fear. And then he adds something Jesus used to say to people too. I will do all that you request. Something that Jesus said to people while he was asking them to put their faith and trust in him. And it seems Boaz is honored to be part of what the Lord is doing in Ruth's life. He's honored to serve the Lord. He's honored to be called to serve the Lord. Is that, is that you? Is that me? Are we, are we honored to serve the Lord? Or are we just, you know, whatever, throw a few shekels in the offering or whatever? It's an honor. And, and it's not just in church. It's, it's all throughout our lives, wherever we are. Verse 12, Boaz raises a complication, which may be why he has never brought up marriage to Ruth, or maybe he knows something that, that they, they don't know. It says, verse 12, now it is true that I am a close relative. However, there is a closer relative than I. Oh. The Christian Standard Bible puts it this way. Yes, it is true that I am a family redeemer, but there is a redeemer closer than I am. Now, back in chapter 2, verse 20, which was a critical verse, Naomi told Ruth that Boaz is one of our relatives. One of our relatives. Verse 13, he says, Stay this night, and in the morning it shall be that if he will perform the duty of a close relative for you, good, let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you. What does he say? Then I will redeem you. As the Lord lives, lie down until morning. He doesn't send her out into the middle of the night. We'll talk about that, Lord willing, next week. Just when we were sitting there, we're reading this story, and we go, oh, they're going to live happily ever after. Oh, this is going to be wonderful. He says, there's one little problem with all this, okay? I'm the second guy in the Leverett line. <laughs> you got to go see some other guy. Imagine the disappointment in Ruth's heart. I mean, oh gosh, what's going through her mind? Why, why wasn't I told this? What, what's going on? And, and, and thinking like, oh my gosh, I'm, I might lose Boaz to some guy I don't even know. And uh, you, you guys, if you don't believe me, uh, ask the ladies you know that men like Boaz don't grow on trees. But they do here from now on, men. Trust me. They do. 
I suspect Naomi knew, but she may have seen the hand of God on Boaz for the role after providing all that food that she did and meeting Boaz by mistake and saying, well, God is at work here. Or maybe she just didn't like the other guy. That other guy, forget him. (laughs) But notice what Boaz, a real man, does. You might want to take some notes on this one, guys. He says to this to her, I will take care of this in the morning. I will not procrastinate. I will not throw it in your lap. I will take care of this thing. No matter what, he tells her, you're going to be okay. Married men, Take note. I remember one guy told off Pam one time at Home Depot. Who do you think was down at Home Depot within 15 minutes? Ringing the manager's neck, not the guy who did it. And I said, I am a Home Depot stockholder, and I'm going to call unless you deal with the guy. He goes, thank you for being a real man. He brought the guy in. Guy said, send her down, and I will apologize. You see, chivalry's not dead. Maybe the world says it is, but it's not. He says, I'll, I'll take care of this. I got it. Doesn't mean that there aren't roles in marriage, and some, some aren't better than others. Some, listen, some of you guys can't add four plus four. You shouldn't be doing the checkbook, Okay. <laughs> Now, so here we are, left hanging on a cliff again. Clearly, the Bible writer understands the grace and the divine providence of God. Once again, here, Ruth. We see in Ruth, the Lord works his plan in the midst of human choices and human circumstances, including suffering. So the Bible scholars will debate, was this a good idea by Naomi or not? God's like, it don't matter to me. I got a plan. I'm, I'm going to fix it. But it's amazing that God works his plans out in the midst of suffering. It may not seem how that could possibly be, but it is. The Lord also works through risks. And, and Ruth keeps on taking risks. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go out and glean I'm going, to go, I'm going to go to the threshing floor. I'm going to lay at the guy's feet. And again, we don't know whether all these things are the right thing or the wrong thing, but here's a soul-searching question for all of us. What risks are we willing to take for the kingdom of God? Are, are we willing to take any? Or are we just playing it safe all the time? And, and do, you want to, do you want to meet God and say, I played it safe? And God says, funny, I didn't. Sent my son to die on a cross. Oh, by the way, you just sang Christmas carols about it. You know, a lot of life is is taking risks. I'm sure when we get to heaven, we'll, when we talk to Ruth about this night, she will be like, what a night. She took a reputation risk and found Boaz to be just like Jesus. Boaz was a kinsman redeemer, but not the kinsman redeemer. That was the Lord Jesus. And his life was very different. Boaz was celebrating at night with his friends, and then he he went to lie down, and he meets the women of his dreams, right? The woman God has for him. Jesus had a last supper with his friends, and he went out to a garden, and he got arrested, Very different. The next day, Boaz says, I'll take care of it. Same thing Jesus did, but what does he take care of? He takes care of making sure that that Ruth will get a husband. Lord Jesus took care of what keeps us out of heaven, our sins against God, by dying on the cross in our place for our sins. In that sense, Boaz says, if that guy won't step up, I'll step up in his place. Then offering to anyone who would put their trust in him all the rights of heaven. Except what was the big difference? 
she uncovered Boaz's feet. But they nailed Jesus' feet to a cross. That's the real love story here that God is pointing us to 1,200 years in advance, covered not by a blanket, but covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. The love of God inviting people not into the darkness, but out of the darkness and into his marvelous light, the light of eternal life. Oh, yeah, Ruth took a risk. Boaz took a risk, but, but Jesus was not even really so much risking his life for you. He was giving his life to you. And so the question becomes, are, have you received that life? Are you willing to receive the sacrifice, what he has done for you, so you could enter into the place prepared for all who trust in him? You can do that today if you never have. You can just say, God, you promised that if I call upon your name, that my sins will be forgiven and I will be saved. Well, let's pray. Well, Lord, this story continues to get more and more complicated. And so is life at times, Lord. And as the worship team comes forward, Lord, we thank you that you have kept your promises to us, Lord. We have them in a book, and all we are asked to do is to respond. Some of us, we have our own opinions. We think we know better than you. So many of us certainly can be even those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus. And yet, Lord, do we really believe your promises? Do we really believe your word? Do we really see the risk you took for us by sending your son and that he has given his life to us, not just for us? And so for any that are here today that have never put their trust in you, I pray they would today. Maybe come up front for prayer after the service or see me on the way out. And I do indeed pray for for those who are troubled, afraid. They don't want to take a risk. They're so afraid of making a mistake, they're not going to do anything. Lord, would they see that you have forgiven all of our sins and you don't necessarily see failure as a sin, but just a step of faith. So, Lord, thank you for these two people who give us such a beautiful picture of what you have done for us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you all to stand.
so glad that you joined us this morning. We hope that we see you back here later after the second service. If you have things to do, that's cool, but we're going to fellowship, we're going to eat, and we're going to gather. God bless you. Hope to see you back here next week.